In this video, I want to talk about finding extreme points when you've got a function of two variables. Remember back in Calc 1, one of the classic applications of the derivative is optimization, uh, finding extreme points, finding maxes and mins. There's a lot of different ways that people say that. Uh, but the idea was you have, you're, you've got a graph and you're looking for where's the high points or where's the low points. Or, um, you want to get the most out of something or you want to spend the least amount of money, right? But somehow you're wanting to optimize. You want to do the best you can. Uh, and it's the same thing with functions of more than one variable, right? That there's going to be times where you want to say, I've got a situation with a couple of variables, but I want to get the most out of it, or I want to spend the least money, or I want to expend the least energy or something, right? That, that somehow there's an, an optimization process happening. So we need to take a look at how do we find extreme values? How do we find maxes and minimums? And it's not surprisingly a lot like what it was in Calc 1. So here's the definition. Uh, suppose you've got a function of two variables, so z is a function of x and y. Um, and it's defined on some open set containing an initial point x0, y0. We will say that the point x0, y0 is a critical point of the function if one of two things happen. Either both the partial derivatives with respect to with respect to y are equal to zero, or one of the partial derivatives doesn't exist. Okay. Compare and contrast with what we did in Calc 1. We said we had a critical point if the derivative was equal to zero, or the derivative was undefined. It didn't exist, right? So it's a very similar definition, except that we've got two partial derivatives now, where before we only had one derivative. A couple more definitions here before we get started uh, doing some work, and that is definitions of uh, local maximums and minimums and global maximums and minimums. Very similar to what we did in Calc 1, right? That we have a function, this time it's a function of two variables uh, that's can defined and continuous on an open set containing the point x0, y0. Then we say that f has a local maximum at x0, y0 if f of x0, y0 is greater than or equal to f of xy for all points in some disk centered at x0, y0. The number f of x0, y0 is called the local maximum value. And I will go on to say that it happens at x0, y0, right? x0, y0 is not the maximum. The function value is the maximum. x0, y0 is just where it happens. Right? This is called a local maximum because we're, we're saying, you know, here's the point x0, y0, and you've got some little disk around it where the, of all those points in that disk, this is the one with the highest function value. A similar notion is what's called the global maximum, where this inequality is true for all xy in the domain, right? So if any value of xy you plug in there, you get a function value that's no bigger than this function value, then this function value is the biggest one, right? And it's the global maximum, whereas the local maximum is only just in some region. I think of this as like, you know, you could be standing on the top of a nearby hill. And if it was a foggy day, you would think you're the you're on top of the world. You've got the you're the highest place around, right? But as soon as the fog clears, then you can say, oh wait, there's a there's a mountain over there that's that's taller than the one I'm standing on. So maybe that is. And then you go climb up on that one, and you can look and say, oh no, there's even a bigger one over over there. You know, at some point you get to the tallest one, right? I think in terms of mountains in all the world, right? You could. You could be standing at, on the top of Mount Baker, and you, you know, you're at the highest point in the state of Washington, but you're not at the highest point in the U.S. Right? Because in the lower 48, the highest point would be Mount Whitney down in California. But if you include, you know, Alaska, uh, then the highest point would be the top of uh, Denali, right? Uh, but then you say, but that's still not the highest point in the world, right? Because then you could go to Mount Everest over in the Himalayas. So from the point of view of altitude above the center of the Earth, uh, the global maximum would be Mount Everest. But any, any mountain peak, any hilltop is still a local maximum. 
And of course, with the idea of local and global maximums, there's also the local and global minimums. Uh, so x0, y0, there is f has a local minimum at x0, y0 if f of x0, y0 is less than or equal to f of xy for all xy in some disk around x0, y0. And it's a global minimum if this inequality is true for all xy in the whole domain. Okay. Now, from all this theorem, this is what we used back in Calc 1, but this is just a bigger version of it. Fermat's theorem says um, if you've got a function of two variables uh, that's defined and continuous on an open set containing the point x0, y0, and suppose that the partial derivatives exist at x0, y0, uh, if f has a local extreme value, that is either a local min or a local max, uh, at x0, y0, then x0, y0 must be a critical point. If you're at the top of a hill or at the bottom of a valley, then either both of your partial derivatives, with respect to x and respect to y, either they're both zero, or one of them doesn't exist. Okay. Recall back in Calc 1, uh, here's three examples of, of, of functions that have critical points at x equals 2. Right? This is an upside down parabola with the vertex there at 2, 4. Right? That's got a high point at the critical point. Likewise here, you have uh, a low point at the critical point. Uh, here, this is a cubic. There is a derivative equal to zero right there. That's a critical point, but it's not a max or a min, right? And there's one more example that I should have drawn right next to that. So hang on a minute. There's a critical point at x equals two, and it happens to be of the kind where the derivative doesn't exist, right? There's there's a sharp corner right there. So the theorem isn't saying if you have a critical point, then you will have a max or a min. Clearly, there's a spot right here that's a critical point, but isn't a max or a min. What the theorem is saying is that if there is a max or a min, then it has to be a critical point. So if you have a high point or a low point, then either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. From a point of view of a function of two variables, it's going to be saying either both partial derivatives are zero, or at least one of the partial derivatives doesn't exist, and that you've got some kind of sharp corner. Let's, let's do an example, see how this works. Here's my function. It's cubic in x and cubic in y. Uh, if I take the partial derivatives, partial derivatives here, partial with respect to x is uh, minus 3x squared plus 27, and the partial with respect to y is negative 3y squared plus 12. I notice that both of those are defined everywhere, so I'm not going to have a sharp corner situation like this. I'm going to have a nice smooth top or bottom, or, or maybe one of those. Uh, let's, let's take a look. So if I'm looking for maxes and mins, I'm looking, I have to look for critical points, because Fermat's theorem says if you've got a max or min, it must be a critical point. So, okay, uh, let's, let's take a look. I need both partials equal to zero. So here's the partial with respect to x equal to zero, which says that x squared equals nine, so x is plus or minus three. Here's the partial with respect to y equal to zero, which says that y squared equals four, so y is plus or minus two. This gives me four critical points uh, at three, two, at three minus two, at minus three, two, and minus three minus two. Each of those satisfies uh, the conditions where both x, uh, partial with respect to x and partial with respect to y are equal to zero. Now, it turned out in this case that the partial with respect to x was just a function of x and the partial with respect to y was just a function of y. Sometimes you'll have x's and y's mixed together and essentially you've got two equations with two variables that you have to solve simultaneously. These are easy to solve because it's my first example and I didn't want to make a hard example. Uh, <laughs> make it easy to solve to see. So I've got these four points. Now, there's nothing inherent about any one of those that would obviously say, oh yeah, this is a max or this is a min, right? Maybe with some information about what the graph looks like, you would be able to see that this is going up or down or that might be a high, if you've got some familiarity with what the graph of something like this looks like. 
um, at this stage of your learning um, here in Calc 3, you probably haven't done a lot of work with graphs of functions of two variables, so you don't necessarily know what this looks like. But it can be figured out without a graphing calculator. But, you know, graphing calculators are all around us nowadays. So let's, uh, let's use one. Uh, so I have two uh, ways of looking at this. I've got it plotted as a surface, and I've got it plotted as a contour plot. And let's take a look at that. So I've got this drawn a couple different ways. Uh, I've got a level curve plot over there on the left, and I've got surface plotted on the right here. Uh, I see it looks like it might be a local maximum here, top of a hill, local minimum there. Uh, they're probably not global because it looks like this function is headed uphill really high, so that that local maximum is only going to be local, but this heads up towards infinity. Likewise, this is headed down to minus infinity over here, so this local minimum will just be local. Um, but that's only two. What are Where are the other two? So uh, the way I have this set up currently, when I move this point around over here, you can see the point on the surface. Now there's a little arrow connected to the point, and that little arrow is a vector. It is the gradient vector. And remember, the gradient always points you in the direction of steepest increase. Right? You can see that that vector is actually, uh, let's, let's, let's move over to someplace else here. How about right, right over here. That's what I want to see. That vector is not pointing up or down, it's just pointing horizontally, saying go in this direction for uh, to go up as fast as possible. Right? And when the level curves are really close together, this is a very steep thing and that gradient gets really long. But when you get to a spot where, where the level curves are further apart, it, the, that vector gets really short. Now, there's four calculated critical points, right? One of them was at the point 3, 2, which is right here. Right? And at the point 3, 2, that gradient vector shrunk down to nothing. And that point that we're looking at is the top of that hill right there. Right? That's the local maximum. Uh, there was uh, 3, negative 2. So if I come down here, uh, this is 3, negative 2 right there. Now this, it turns out, is not a maximum or a minimum. This is what's called a saddle point. If I move vertically here in the y direction, right, this is headed up towards that local maximum. I'm going uphill. Likewise, if I'm here, if I head in the negative y direction, uh, you can see that gradient vector starting to point away from the critical point. So this point right here, it looks like, at least in the y direction, that you're at a low point. However, in the x direction, notice that the gradient vector points back towards that critical point. Right over here, the gradient vector points back towards that critical point. So from the point of view in the x direction, it looks like you're at a maximum. So you're at neither. This is a maximum in the x direction. It's a minimum in the y direction. This is what's called a saddle point. It is a critical point because you can see the gradient has shrunk down to the zero vector. Um, it's a critical point, but it's not an extreme point. It's not a maximum or a minimum, right? This point over here at negative three, negative two, uh, notice that the, the gradient is pointing away here. The gradient is saying uphill is away from, uh, is away from this point right here. And this point is the local minimum at negative three, negative two. Right? You can see it. You can see it on the graph over here at that low point. You can see it on the contour plot as the center of these rings. Right? Of course, the center of these rings look a lot like the center of those rings. So that unless you have the, the contours labeled, it's hard to tell whether you're at a max or a min. Um, but I like having this gradient pointing around in different directions because I can see which direction is uphill. Right? And the, the fourth critical point is this one right here, which is, again, another saddle point. Saddle points have a very distinct look when you're looking at contour plots. They have this kind of X, right? You've got, you've got contours that are 
you've got contours that are getting bigger as you get closer to them, right? The, the corresponding to higher elevation. And then going back down again on the other side. But here you've got the contours going that way. That way. So the, the saddle points look like, well, they look like kind of like hyperbolas coming together there where the maxes and mins look like ellipses or circles coming in to the point. So looking at this, I can pick out quickly max min, max min. I can't tell necessarily unless things are labeled which is which, but I can definitely tell saddle points. So I can see the four critical points there. So the net result here is that I have a local maximum we decided at 32 and the local maximum value is 70 so the maximum value is 70 it happens at 32 we had a local minimum value at negative 3 negative 2 and that local minimum value is negative 70. i should point out that when i drew this graph here i scaled things by a factor of 40. so however tall it was supposed to be i just scaled it down vertically you know, in the z direction so the heights aren't matching what I, you know, I wasn't seeing a height of 70. I was probably seeing a height of seven fourths, right? Just a little less than two because I scaled things down in order to get it to look reasonable. Um, but it didn't change where the critical points were. Uh, and then I saw that the other two critical values were saddle points. Our next task is to be able to tell without looking at the graph, when do you have a saddle point? When do you have a max? When do you have a min? And that we will do in the next video.